Uh, today's scripture comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 956. Verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord. We are in part two of the series. It's a short series, four parts at the beginning of the year that I'm calling 20, Vision 2018. And at the beginning of the year, I like to give messages that, you know, that bore down on the core things that our church stands for and to refresh our vision. Now, it's especially for those of you, if you're new and, and you're, you're new into our church community, this is a good time to, to come and just figure out what is it that, that this, this church stands for. But for those of you who are regulars, I think that maybe more than ever, this, this year, this is a really great time for us to really come back to, um, to really stand on. These are the core things that we are about since we're going to be, um, we're going to be uh, set off as a new church. Now, last week I preached on this passage, 1 Corinthians 9, and I'm giving you a second message which comes at it from a different angle. And this week I want to talk about um, the churched, the dechurched, and the unchurched. That's the message, uh, reaching the unchurched and the dechurched. And it's in this passage. It may not, I mean, I know that's not, that language is not in this passage. It's talking about, to the Jews, I will be like a Jew. That's a strange um, way that Paul is putting it. But let me get into it. Um, in three parts, part one, Jews and Greeks as churched and unchurched. Okay? So when you see Jews and Greeks in this passage, I don't want you to just think about ethnic Jews or ethnic Greeks. What we're talking about, I think, I think the real great application of this passage is, do you know how to look at people as churched folks or as unchurched folks far from God, or, and don't know much about God in the Bible, right? That's part one, Jews and Greeks as churched and unchurched. Part two, seeing our unchurched neighbors in Silicon Valley. And so um, I've been the pastor here in the beginning of February, it'll be nine years, and I've given kind of a couple variations of this message before, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you a, a PowerPoint presentation, just give you a little picture of a snapshot of what Silicon Valley is like, what our neighbors are like, okay? And then in part three, becoming all things to save some. That's the heart of Paul. I hope that it will also be the heart of us, all right? All things to some people so that we can save some, because that's what we need to be like in order to um, be a good church here in this city, all right? So part one. Jews and Greeks as churched and unchurched. Um, to start with, I'd like to give you a, a lesson in Bible reading. Okay? And this is actually a very sophisticated and pretty advanced understanding of how to approach the Bible. It's the kind of stuff, I mean, honestly, this isn't um, first year seminary stuff. It's something more like third year seminary stuff. Um, maybe even when you get more to like advanced masters and PhD work, in seminary. But if you can grasp this, and this is a pretty sophisticated piece of Bible learning, if you can grasp this concept and then apply it into the Bible, because it's especially important in this passage, it'll, it'll, it could, I hope it will, um, the, the Holy Spirit will open up huge new avenues of how you look at not only the Bible, but then through the Bible you can look at the world. Now this um, idea that I want to um, give you, in, this, in, the, in seminary we even have a name for it, it's called typology. It's called typology. And what that means is there's a reality that we're used to. We know what that's like. We experience it all the time. We go into that thing, and then 
the Lord uses that. There's a, this, there's, a, there's a pattern that's in the scriptures itself. He uses that to point to another reality, a bigger reality. This is how God works. So in the Bible, you know, obviously we can't just know what God is like. But what God does is he points to realities that we do know. And then he says, this is something you know, okay? And then this is the thing that you know. And then it becomes a metaphor a metaphor to something we don't know. <laughs> and so it's, a, it's an entryway. This thing is like, this, the, the reality of God is something like this. And so, you, you know, parables are like this. Jesus uses a parable of the seeds, and the seed is like the word which goes, I mean, he literally straight explains it. But typology is like the, the overall bigger thing. And so um, let me give you an example of this um, that's not right here from this passage. And by the way, some people think this is just something you're just making up. And this is a way that's uh, very important about how does God use his word. It seems like it's only in this passage, isn't he talking about Jews? And isn't he talking about non-Jews? And this, in this, in this time, they would have called them Greeks because they, they spoke Greek. That's the civilization and culture of the times. And so he goes, isn't this passage just talking about Jews and Greeks? And if it was only talking about Jews and Greeks, wouldn't it be largely irrelevant to me and to you? You're, like if you in your life don't have many Jewish friends, and I imagine most of you have very, very few Greek friends. I don't have any Greek friends. I've got a couple of Jewish friends. You would go, this passage isn't very relevant, but that's not all the passage is talking about. And there may be some cynical folks. That's one of the complaints about secular folks about Christianity is that they talk about things inside the Bible, and they only talk about things in the Bible, and they don't seem very relevant to my life and, and, and our world. And so then, why, why should we pay attention to any of this if it's not very relevant? They don't, most of the folks don't just simply say, oh, that's wrong, or I don't, you know, they may say, I don't believe in that. They'll just go, well, you know, they, what they, what the words that I, I typically hear is, oh, I'm so glad that that works for you. But if you press them a little further, but I don't really find that to be relevant for me. But actually, through typology, that's a, it's a very powerful way that God says something seemingly only for one time in one place, but actually it becomes a very powerful word for all times and all places. So um, just give you another, to give you another example that's different from this passage. In Ephesians chapter 5, it's one of the most important places in the Bible. So if you want some good marriage advice... You can go find this in Ephesians 5, and then we have a whole series on this in, in, in our sermon series, but where God breaks, where the Apostle Paul gets teaching on, on marriage. And then he says the husband should be like this, and the wife should be like this, etc., etc. And then it's a series of verses, and then at the very last verse, he says something really weird. He says, but what I'm actually talking about is Christ and the church. That's what he's talking about. So it seems like he's talking about husbands and wives and marriage as we know it. But then he's, and then all of a sudden he flips it around and says, but I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. And so while you're reading this passage, you're thinking about your marriage or your friend's marriage or your parents' marriage, all the normal marriage, the, the thing that we're, very, the common reality that we're used to. But then at the end, all of a sudden, there is what, and this is how typology works. He realized, we realize that he's talking about something bigger and deeper than all the individual marriages that we know. So now just think about this. If marriage is not really, say, you know, I'm Susan, I'm a husband, my wife is Grace, or we got Jeff and Jenny, or like Ron and Jane. This is, these are the marriages that we know. Is that what the passage is? It is that we're talking about those marriages. But actually, what, what the Bible says is actually talking about something more than that. <laughs> What's more, that the bigger marriage, that since marriage itself is actually a picture of a bigger marriage, a bigger kind of more profound relationship that's from God and for God and of God for us, and that is the relationship of the Son of God, Jesus, to his bride, the church. That's actually the deeper understanding of marriage. So I want you to say this for a moment. Most of us think about marriage, and we only see marriage from our own, like, narrow perspective. So, like, I'm married, and I think I know what marriage is like because I'm, you know, because I've been married for 20 years. Like, that's a lot of experience of marriage, right? Well, not really. <laughs> it's still one man and one woman, and they're narrow 20 years thinking about marriage. And then you go, okay, I know more about marriage because I've read books about marriage, and I've been around lots of married, other couples, and so I know lots. Actually, even still, that's only your time, your culture, your place is understanding of marriage. It's still very narrow. 
Who really knows what marriage is? Isn't it God? <laughs> and he says, actually, your marriage is actually a pointer to a bigger reality itself, which is really the relationship of the Son of God to his bride. That's the real thing that all the individual little marriages, as little, we're like the lesser thing and he's the real thing. Does that make sense? Now, let me just stop for a moment here. If that's the case, do you realize that you shouldn't look at your marriage primarily in your relationship to your wife or your relationship to your husband or like you even go, go find some other couple that you think is better than you, like their marriage works better than you, which is always a good piece of, advice, uh, of wisdom, right? And then go learn from them how to do marriage. That's a good piece of wisdom. But actually the, the most real thing is to see how does Jesus love his bride and how she is supposed to respond to him. That's the real thing. And if that's the real thing, then all the other individual little marriages can be put up against the real, the most real reality itself, and then we can see how we're actually supposed to be. See, that's how typology works. Now, let me make one other comment about this before I move on. Um, we live in a time, and I just think it's worth saying this, even though that's not exactly what this passage is about. Um, because I'm teaching you this, you know, this, um, this issue of how to read the Bible is in this passage. I want to teach this to you now. There's a, you know, we live in a culture right now where you know, the Supreme Court says that a man can marry a man or a woman can marry a woman, and we call this thing gay marriage, right? And why is it that Christians don't agree with this thing? At least you're not supposed to. There's some, there are some people who call themselves Christians. They say you agree with this thing. But if you're an orthodox, Bible-believing Christian, you can't agree with that. You know why? Because of exactly what I just told you. Because the Bible says there's a man, he's supposed to teach, you know, treat a woman this way, and a woman's supposed to treat a man this way, and that's marriage. But then actually, the real thing, it's a type. Each one is a pointer to the, to the bigger reality itself, which is how Christ, as a bridegroom, treats his bride and how she's supposed to respond to him. That's real marriage. This is why orthodox Bible-believing Christians, we can't agree with our culture when they say, you know what, we want to kind of open this up for gay folks. We can't. Maybe we would like that we have compassion on our, I hope you have compassion and love for our, our gay neighbors. I do, and that's certainly biblical and right and true, but we can't agree with this part. So that's just to give you, that gives you a, just one sense of like how there's deep understanding in the Bible that we can't, we can't just a monkey around with and how this, this powerful vision of typology works. Now let's get back to this passage. Let's see how typology works in this passage. Now it says to a Jew, I'll be like a Jew. And this is really weird because Paul himself is ethnically Jewish. <laughs> And so he was saying, so really, if in this time, those who are Jewish, they follow the Mosaic law. And Paul grew up, he completely understands the Mosaic law. But now that he has followed Jesus, Jesus is saying, actually, I have a reign and a law that's far greater than the Mosaic law. In fact, you don't have to follow the Mosaic law. And he's saying, I don't follow the Mosaic law. In fact, I can eat pork. And he would. <laughs> so this guy, growing up Jewish his whole life, never touched pork. <laughs> And now that he knows he's supposed to go reach to, a, to the Jews, I'll be like a Jew. So when I'm hanging out with them and they don't eat pork and then they're going to like, you know, have their clean, cleanly laws, I'll follow those things for their sake. Those aren't bad. Those aren't sin. I will follow them and be like them for their sake. Right? But then when I go hang out with all the Greeks and then, you know, we're going we're gonna to have pork chops for dinner. You know what? <laughs> I'm going to eat the pork chops. And they're like, aren't you Jewish? So yes. But you're eating what we eat, and you're being like us. He's like, yes, because I'm free. But, you know, it may not be quite his culture, but to those outside of the law, what he means, not, not outside the law of God, the law, outside the mosaic, I'll become like them. And in this passage, it's a tremendously important principle for how our church needs to be. Our church is all about the gospel. It's all about what Jesus Christ has done for us, what we could not do for ourselves. And if we're going to have the gospel, it can't just for me, be for me. How can you take salvation for all nations and say, well, it's just going to be a Korean thing? Or it's just going to be a white guy's thing? Or it's just going to be, a, you, you know, you're just filling the name of the bank, our thing. That can't be, if we're truly going to be about the gospel, we should have this spirit. When we're going to go be around the Jews, you know what? In order to win Jews, 
I don't have to eat pork. I'm going to allow myself to have that. It's not a bad thing. It's not a sin. I will go in and be like one of them in order to win them. And then when I'm around the Greeks, I'll be like one of them in order to win them. But it's not just about ethnicity. So I think if the passage was only about ethnicity, it wouldn't be a very interesting or a very powerful passage. But actually, many, many Bible scholars have thought about this and realized that the deeper issue, because the Bible is very explicit, that Christ's salvation is for all nations. How do you break this bounds? This is an incredibly important passage to talk about. How do you keep it not only in the bounds of my own circle of people, but you go out there and reach a bunch of other people? This is the principle. And so last week I gave you, and I just kind of reviewed this, how it's about one ethnicity going out and saying, I will stretch myself to reach another, to take the heart of the gospel and reach another. But I think there's another even, even more profound um, in a lot of ways, a more profound um, application here, which is what I like to call churched and unchurched. Who are Jews? Jews are the people that grew up with the Bible. In one way or another, they know the promises that God has done many, many years ago and how he has unfurling. They know that God called a man named Abraham, that he said that I will, through you, there will be one that will come that will redeem all of Israel and even de- and bless all the nations of the world. That's the promise. Those are the people that I'll call the Jews. Well, today, even if you're not Jewish, there are people like that. And who are those? Well, those are people, who, if you grew up in the church, And so when I read the Jews, to the Jews, I'll be like a Jew. I also see not just ethnic Jews, but to the church, to the people who grew up in the church and know the stuff of the Bible, I will will be like them. (laughs) And if you notice this, that people who are in, in the church and of the church, they tend to be different than the rest of the unchurched, and that's, of course, that's how it should be, right? But sometimes, you know, they are churched in a bad way. And what I mean by that is they go in the church and they have certain like rules and they patterns that, that, that if you follow them, then, then you signal, I'm one of you guys. Okay, well, that's what he's talking about here. But it also could be in a bad way or in a very kind of limiting way, which is that people outside the church always feel like, oh, I'm not one of those guys. And I'm, I'm kind of, I feel very excluded or uncomfortable and I don't know how to connect here inside this community. And so just to give a couple examples like... Um, There are some church communities, for instance, that um, if you don't drink beer, if you don't drink beer, that's just considered just bad. You're a sinner, okay? And so, so, so thus, you know, the people see that as a part of Christianity, but it's not a part of Christianity. (laughs) It's really not a part of Christianity. It could be. It's a maybe a good piece of wisdom. I mean, we should all control our alcohol um, intake. And it is certainly a good practice that maybe if in a room this size, there could be somebody with an alcohol, you know, alcoholic, alcoholism um, addiction. And so for their sake, we won't drink. You know, that's a good practice. But it's not a rule about being a Christian. And so that tends to kind of like, tends to make people feel on the outside looking in. So if you as a Christian feel that like as a Christian, I can't ever drink. But then what are you going to do if you get invited to somebody's house and they're not Christian, and they offer you a glass of wine. In fact, they, offer, they open up a really nice bottle of wine. <laughs> and you know that's an expense. Well, maybe you don't know because you don't drink. <laughs> and they offer, and they pour it into, they offer you a glass, and they opened it up because they're hosting you. Are you going to refuse that glass of wine? <laughs> Wouldn't that be rude? <laughs> um, and so to the unchurched, I will be like the unchurched, in other words, to be, and those are what Greeks are. Greeks are the people who don't know the Bible and who aren't from the church. And to the unchurched, I'll be like the church, unchurched. Not according to their sins or their idolatries, but, but in anything that's good and fine, so that I may win some. Can you have that heart? That's what this passage is about. And I hope that that will be the heart of our whole church. That when people come in, okay, oh, let me give you a second example of the way like church culture that I like to call churchianity. I'll, in our church, we're always, I always feel like we should blow holes into our ch- various kinds of churchianity so that people who are, aren't in our circles can more and more feel like they can be welcomed and embraced and made to feel at home so that when they hear about Jesus, they can go, Man, that makes sense. And you know, these people, I think they can love me. I can can be a part of this. 
I can be a part of this family. And so another one is like a church, churchy language. <laughs> There's a lot of Christian language. Um, you know, uh, among my past friends, they call it Christianese. <laughs> Are you a person that speaks, hey, you know, how, how, how's your QTs, man? Do you know that outside the church, nobody knows what the heck a QT is? They're like, what, what, the, what the heck are you talking about? But Christians just talk to each other like that. Hey, how's your walk, man? How's your walk? They're like, I walk okay. <laughs> and what we mean is, how is your walk? How do you walk in life with Jesus? Right? But that's not how unchurched people talk. In fact, they just think it's weird when we talk like this. And then we have, and every family has a kind of in language. But I also want us to be very, very sensitive to the fact that in this, in this service, every single Sunday morning, you know what? I believe that our church should be geared to the unchurched. The unchurched and the de-churched are the people who used to go to church and then they stopped going to church, right? Whether they stopped going to church 10 years ago or, or like, you know, one year ago. But our church, and sometimes and I've heard some of you say this, that our church feels a little different. It should. I hope it does. Because the vast majority of churches are geared, guess what, to reach the church. <laughs> they only know how to talk. And then they do preaching and teaching in a way for people. Who, they kind of assume a lot. But actually, our church is very intentionally geared to reach the unchurched and the dechurched. And if you ask me, if you... Target and seek the unchurched and dechurched, guess what? It works for the churched. <laughs> it works for the church too. But if you only reach seek the churched, it won't work. Oftentimes it doesn't work for the unchurched and the dechurched. So that's the, the principle I want to lay down. We stand to reach the unchurched and the dechurched through the gospel. The gospel, according to the Bible, Romans chapter 1, is the power of God. It isn't just the words of God, it is the power of God for eternal life. And it is for the power of God for eternal life. It's very explicit for both the Jew and the Greek. And you know when I hear that? For both the churched, the Christian needs the gospel, and the person who thinks he's nowhere near Jesus, doesn't know anything about the Bible, the unchurched person, is the power of God for them to have eternal life. Okay? So that's part one. Let's go to part two. Can we um, turn on our, our, our slides? All right. So, and maybe catch a light there, um, William. Thank you. All right. I'm going to give you a little presentation about um, what our city is like. Maybe flip the other way. Great. Okay. And, um, you know, you, we live in this city, and we all tend to do what we normally do. We find, you know, our, our, our crew. <laughs> we find our tribe and our homeboys and the people that are like us and whoever that is for you, all right? Everybody does this. It's just kind of the way we operate. But what I want to do today is I want you to have eyes open for the people who are of different ethnicity than us and who are unchurched and dechurched. And by the way, they're all the, that's one and the same. <laughs> all right, and so um, I've, I've done this a couple times in our church, and most people, you know, I hope some of this um, information will surprise you. <laughs> you probably don't know this. Maybe you kind of vaguely heard something like that, maybe from someone like me. But actually, once you learn the actual empirical data, it's actually pretty surprising. Okay, so let's go to get into this. Is this working? <laughs> no, it's not working. All right, William. Next. Can you get it? Oh, there we go. All right. First, let's just talk about... Um, Unchurched, churched, unchurched, dechurched. I'm going to give you uh, Barna. Have you ever heard of the Barna Group? The Barna Group is a, is a big research think tank. It's a Christian research think tank. They're especially good at asking Americans about their faith life. And Barna is run by Christians, and you know, Christianity is the dominant faith in America. And so, you know, of course, they're, they're often especially interested in how are, are people practicing their Christian faith. So, um, churched, what they mean by churched is they have attended church service in the last seven days, okay? So that's a very, very practical definition. In the last seven days. In other words, they probably go to church regularly, right? And so, um, active churchgoers in America are practically two out of five. Oop, what happened there? There you go. Are, are almost 40% Americans. If you live in the Bay Area, that seems very, very surprising, doesn't it? Because <laughs> um, you're like two out of five folks that I know sure as heck don't go to church, all right, or, or practice their Christian faith. But 
Active churchgoers in America are almost 40% of the population. But unchurched is actually even more. <laughs> Not by much. They're very, very close. And de church is quite a lot too. Now, obviously, you can see that doesn't make up to 100%. I don't exactly know how they play that out. So I guess some of the people, you know, when you ask them these questions, they, they, will, they will more self identify as de church versus unchurched. I think that's how you end up getting that big number. But um, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's most of America. So, so that's America, okay? Um, there we go. Um, most unchurched cities in, in, uh, in the USA. <laughs> so this is the top five, according to Barna. Just, this is just last year. So very, very fresh data. The most unchurched metropolitan in the USA is right here, 60%. Um, not too surprising, Reno, Vegas, Massachusetts, apparently people don't, a lot of people um, either don't know Jesus or have forgotten about what Jesus is like in Massachusetts. I've lived there. Um, I, I, I lived in Boston for three years with my wife. I can, I can attest to you. It is a very, very unchurched and increasingly post-Christian culture. Um, but it feels like, and I think, and the numbers also show that it's even more so here. Right, and so that's what I um, de church cities in the U.S. What's at the top of the list? <laughs> Ta da! Surprise! It's us. Okay, it's us. And again, here we go. Um, we have Seattle. That's not a surprise. You know, Massachusetts again, Boston area. And here's how they define: formerly, they were very somewhat or minimally active in church, but now they haven't attended in six months. If we go back, um, they have not attended church. It's just a very simple definition. You go to church in the last six months, and by the way, they don't mean like you went to a wedding <laughs> or you went to a funeral, like you actually went to go worship. You attended church to go worship in the last six months. And um, in the Bay Area, it's the highest percentage, right? And then the highest percentage of those folks. And then they, have, they used to go to church, but then they don't anymore. Again, Bay Area, highest percentage, right? Then in a slightly different study, Barna gave a group of what they called who are the most or the fewest practicing Christian. Ta-da, again. Who's at the top of the heap? Right here. And um, how do they define it? They're the respondents who say that faith is very important in their life, and they have attended service sometime in the last month. So sometime less with the U.S. average is 36%, right? But the Bay Area... Not even, I mean, not even half that, 17%. So this is a, that's where we live, right? People who are, we have the fewest number percentage of practicing Christians here. Now let's talk about our county. And I just want to give you, a, just first, just an overall picture of our county. Our county, thus, is essentially one of the most unchurched places in all of America. And if we're going to be a church here, we have to be a church for the unchurched. I'll just give you a, pic a picture. Population, almost 2 million. Median age, and by the way, so if you don't remember your high school algebra, where we learned about median, mean, and mode, median means, median means the number right smack in the middle. You get a, gra you grab a group of people together, and then everyone who's above, and then half is above, and half is below, literally, this is a number right smack in the middle. So if you, median age of Santa Clara County is a little bit, is slightly under that of the U.S. Uh, median. And so if you're 37, you're slightly younger than half of this county. And if you're like me, um, I guess I'm on the old side, okay? I'm on the old half, all right? Um, median household income. Now you can define that if you're on the richer side, the richer half, or the poorer half. My wife and I, were apparently on the poorer half, okay? We make less than 102000 in the household, right? Um, U.S. median is 56000 so this is a rich county, and that's not a surprise, right? Um, poverty rate, and this can't be a surprise, uh, the poverty rate, according to U.S. You know, US government standard, 13.5% of America is in the poverty, is in the poverty, um, poverty standard. And in our county, just over 8%. And again, that's not a surprise. But it's not a surprise that we're less than the USA. But to me, it is a surprise that even 8% of our county qualifies as in the poverty zone, according to US standards. Because I, I wonder, how do you even make it if you are in the poverty zone in, in Silicon Valley? That's tough, right? 
And it's tough because why median property value is almost a million dollars, okay? It's 800, I mean, do you understand what an astronomical number this is? If you feel that you are barely making it in our city, it's because of this, right? <laughs> and this is what it is in America, okay? In America, it's not even half that number, okay? And so, and this is very, very fresh data, November 2017. And just if you're curious, for those of you who are more nerdy, where'd you get this data, Pastor Susan? It's, it's from Deloitte, some group called Data Wheel, and a professor named Cesar Hidalgo, who I think is out of MIT. Okay, so pretty good stuff, all right? Um, that's Santa Clara County. Now let's look a little bit more into our county. Our county by race. Um, the biggest racial group, and this isn't, I don't know, it's entirely helpful because obviously Asians, that's a big group. We're talking, we're talking Filipinos, we're talking Indians, they count Indians as Asian, Japanese, you name them, all right? Thai folks, and, but, we're the biggest racial group. The Asians are the biggest racial group. I'm Asian. I'm going to say we. I'm talking me, and some of you aren't Asian, but most of you in this room are. 34% plus, right? Then it's Caucasians. Then it's Hispanic. And in 2009, when I came here to be a pastor, I, I did the studies, and this was one of my first, one of my first um, sermons in this church because I wanted to say, hey, our church needs to understand our neighbors. Let me tell you something. This number, the, the, the white folks were still the, the majority. And then it, was, um, then it was the Hispanics. Then it was the Asians. Nine years ago. That's just nine years ago. In nine years, that has already tipped. So I just gave you a couple of those biracials. Interesting because a number of you are biracial or you're going to have biracial children. And that number is growing. And, and um, we are a city that's different than just about every other major American city. Almost every other major American city has far more black folks, right? And in America, that's the most painful racial divide in America, white and black. And we are just an odd, we are a really odd city in America because that's not one of our most pressing issues in, in this city, all right? So just to give you this, two years before, two years before, Here's the percentage, white, 33.8, Asian, 33.2. So in 2014, 2014 is when that number tipped, 2015. And by the way, so do you think, this is 2018 now, do you think this number, 34.6, is bigger and white is smaller? Or do you think it's about the same? I'm going to tell you something. I think the Asian number is even bigger in 2018. And the white number is even smaller. My white pastor friends are saying, hey, people in my church are moving out of town. They're going to Sacramento. They're going to Southern California. They're going to Portland. They're going to Texas. They're going to Colorado. Right? So, and yet, as, as insanely expensive as our city is, the Asians keep coming. That's what our, that's what our county's like. Right? My language. Um, I'm using language because I can't quite you know, find the uh, um, ethnicity. So... You're probably wondering, like, what was what your ethnic makeup? I'm going I'm to use language as kind of a proxy, but just to give you just almost half of our city. Half, you know, when I talk about the city, I'm talking like just San Jose. I'm talking greater San Jose. I'm talking Silicon Valley, the whole county. Almost half are, they are native non-English speakers. <laughs> okay, so when they, this, is, this, uh, this study done here back in 2015, we're talking about native I mean, my daughter can speak Chinese, but she's not a native Chinese speaker, OK? Um, native Spanish speakers, 17%. Native Chinese speakers, 7%. And you know the fourth most, um, most commonly spoken language in, in our city is? It's Vietnamese. Did you know that? Hmm. Did you know that? There's almost as many Vietnamese speakers in our city as, uh, as Chinese speakers. So let's look at this now by ethnicity. Now, this is how I, I came up with these numbers. Or they did it not by counting the ethnicity, but they did it by the speaking. And so all these numbers, if you just want to think about ethnicity, they're understated. You understand what I'm saying here? Because here we're talking about native Spanish speakers. But do you think that's only the number of Spanish speakers in our city? So if you're like a second or third gen generation Mexican-American, they may speak Spanish imperfectly, but they're not counted in this number. Does that make sense? Huh? This number, 
So do you think there's only 137,000 Chinese folks that are saying no? Because all the third and fourth generation ABCs, they're not counted in that number, so there's a lot more Chinese folks than that. But this just gives you an idea. So we have a lot of Spanish speakers, got lots of Chinese folks, and the third largest ethnicity in our city are the Vietnamese. Not just 117,000, more than 117,000, because they are second and now third generation Vietnamese, and they probably speak or don't, they speak Vietnamese very poorly or imperfectly. Some are fluent, some are not, like me, you know, like they speak, I speak Korean very poorly. And this might surprise you. Um, what's the next most common language? This surprised me. It's Tagalog. <laughs> Did you know there's that many Filipino folks in our, in our city? And are they reached? for Jesus? How many um, Tagalog-speaking uh, churches are there in our, in our city? I don't really know of any, <laughs> right? In other words, they're unreached, they're unchurched. And many of you are wondering about the Indians. Okay, there's tons of Indians. You know, well, they don't only speak one language, and so I gave you the data this way. Hindi, other Indic, so I know like um, some Indian guys, they speak Tamil, right? So I guess they would fall under, uh, under Indic. And Gujarati, they're also from India, India. And so if you add up all these numbers, that's something like 70,000. So that's more than the Filipinos. And you guys know this number is growing, growing, growing. And again, that does not count the second generation Indian Americans who, may, who, may not, who are not native speakers of Gujarati or Hindi or Tamil but they're in our city, and they keep coming, right? Now, some of you guys are wondering, okay, what about, um, you know, a lot of us are in this room are Koreans. You want to know what, how many of us are uh, Koreans? Here you go, 22,000. In 2009, you know how many were, uh, Korean speakers there were? There were 25,000. The Japanese were 14,000. You know how many Japanese speakers there were in um, in 2009, there were 26,000. The Japanese speakers are leaving our city. And the Koreans have shrunk, actually, uh, from 2009 to 2015. And lots of Persians, did you know lots of Iranians live in our city? <laughs> and they are not reached for Jesus. Um, I know one Iranian pastor. <laughs> um, I know one Persian church. It's right there in Sunnyvale, right? And I know one second generation Iranian pastor. Um, he's actually not at that church anymore. He went to um, he went to one of the larger you know white churches in our in our city, and he's he's their missions pastor. Great 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 pastor, right? But most the vast majority of Persians they're not reached. Hmm. Maybe you have a Persian friend. Hmm. Um, Portuguese is actually quite a bit spoken, and I think by the way these are not Portuguese Portuguese. They are Brazilians. <laughs> I think most of these folks are Brazilian. And, and, um, and just for our, our, our German-speaking brother, I just gave, decided to give you that data, OK? Just to show you a little love there, brother, all right? <laughs> um, and, the, and there's still a good number of Arabic. And look at all these folks. They're not reached. And they do not know about the Bible. And they have and they've heard of this guy, Jesus, but mostly they have misconceptions. So, William, you can turn that off now. Um, let me close my message. It says in verse 22, um, to the weak I became weak. And in this world, when you're a minority, you are weak in the society. And um, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. That's what Paul's saying. To the Jews, I try to become like them. And to the Greeks, I try to become, it's not easy. But you know, um, as I said this to you last week, there's somebody else that's even more true of, and that's Jesus. Imagine if Jesus didn't have this view. You know, he's up in his, his tribe, you know, heaven. There's no sin up there. Nobody's selfish. There's no poverty. There's no racism. There's nobody acting like total jerks up there. There's no divorce. There's no abuse. There's no murder. There's no crime. There's no lying, cheating, stealing. That's the culture, the tribe of heaven. That's where Jesus is from. 
And then he said, look at that tribe down there, those unchurched, dechurched people. They know nothing about God. And they know nothing about the Bible. You know what? It's uncomfortable huh, to hang out with them. I don't, I don't think I'm going to go there. Is that what Jesus said? Is that his heart? If that was his heart, then we would all, if you're not Jewish, we would all not make it, right? And, well, as far as I know, there's no Jews in this room. We would, none of us would be redeemed. But Jesus said to the unchurched, even to the unchurched, even to the people who know nothing about me, never heard of my name, and a lot of their practices, and they have all these wrong conceptions about God and even morality, Jesus came to become all things to all of us. And, his, and he would take even the cross, shed his blood to wash us of our sins, to win us. Right? And as I hope that that will be our heart. And that's the gospel. It's the good news. It's unbelievably good news, is it? And can this news stay for us? I'd like to close my message with a dream. <laughs> okay? I'll tell you a couple of personal things about, about myself and why it leads to a dream that I have and kind of like how it shaped me to be a, the pastor that I am and the kind of church that I believe in. Right? It's because I believe in the Bible, but how I apply this scripture into you know, the certain personal details. Of my, I'll tell you like two things about me. Um, I'm fifth generation Christian in my family. In the 19th century, a white guy from America became a missionary to Korea. He made my great-great-grandfather, who was a blind fortune teller. That's how my great-great-grandfather made his money. He was a blind dude who apparently had a lot of like social, like he could just sense what you were like, and then he would tell you lies about you, and then you would fork over a lot of money. That's kind of how he made his living. Until this white guy from this country on the other side of the world came to him and visited him and told him about Jesus. And he sacrificed his comfort zone. He became all things to these weird Korean people so that some of them could be saved. And now, generations later, Korea is like a 25% Christian country. (laughs) In fact, Koreans are not an unchurched people, are they? (laughs) Koreans are, you can't call them an unchurched people. The vast majority of Koreans in the city are at the very least churched or de-churched, not unchurched. That is an incredible base of operation to go reach the unchurched. And so five generations later, now my my sons and daughters, they're sixth generation. And we have a church like this. And any Korean in the city has like multiple churches to to, to choose from where they can hear the gospel and they can feel comfortable in in their culture. But that's not true for Filipinos. It's not true for those who speak some Arabic language. It's not true for Vietnamese. There's literally six times the number of Vietnamese as Koreans in our city. (laughs) And there's no churches for them. And there's only, there's literally, when I say there's a handful of Vietnamese Christians, it is literally a handful. And all of them are super precious. (laughs) And I'll tell you the other thing, the other story that I'll tell you about my life. I, I'm, a, I'm a San Jose native. My family moved to San Jose when I was in the fifth grade, and we lived in South San Jose. At the time, it was majority white. The Mexicans, there was a lot of Mexicans in my school, and the Vietnamese had just started moving into the neighborhood. You know, they were mostly refugees from Vietnam, Vietnam and for whatever reason, why not? The weather's good in San Jose, and at that time, it wasn't insanely expensive. How is this? You could buy a house for less than $100,000 in, in the early 80s. Isn't that nice? You just go back in time and tell all those Vietnamese, buy this house, <laughs> and just sit on it, and you'll be rich, okay? But I had a friend. There, there was a guy when I was in the fifth grade. He came in, and he, was, he had just literally come off the boat. I mean, he had literally come off the boat. And he came into class, and he spoke utterly zero English. And his name was Hai Wen, right? H-A-I, Hai Wen. And he looked in this room, and he saw a bunch of white faces, and he saw a bunch of, like, Mexican kids. And he said, and he just felt out of place. And he looked for somebody whom he thought 
he could befriend, and he saw one Asian face in the room, and who was that? That was me, <laughs> right? And my teacher, she was African American. She could see it too. And so at the beginning of, you know, when she first came in, he first came to class, Hai sat in the other side of the room. But two days later, <laughs> she moved Hai and sat him next to me, right? And I became, he had literally only two friends. I, my best buddy was a white kid named John Norris. And Hai became friends with us. And there are many people in the city they're not going to hear the gospel from one of the, the big white churches in our, in our city. But they might hear it from a church with a bunch of Korean and Chinese folks and half Korean and half Chinese or half white and half Chinese. I mean, just the other kind of strange folks like this church. If we would be a church not just for my tribe, but for them. So hi. Hi. If you're hearing this message, <laughs> find me on Facebook, dude. And I hope you believe in Jesus. And let's catch up. I'll, I'll take you to some good Phil's coffee, right? And I hope many of you, you will look at your Vietnamese friends, your Filipino friends, your Chinese friends, and say the gospel's for you. Our church is for you. Our church wants to love you. Hmm. Let's pray. Father, so many people, the world, literally the world comes here. And they come here to get rich. But actually, we have something to offer them, which is far, far better than money. Infinitely better than money. We have to offer them salvation, forgiveness, mercy, grace. A love which can never be defeated the love of God through our Savior, Jesus. We are so incredibly grateful, Jesus, that you left your tribe and you had the same heart as Paul. In fact, Paul had your heart, the heart of the good news, the gospel, to become all things for all people, to save some. And we thank you that you would do whatever it took, including the cross, to come redeem us and love us forever. Would you give us, would you pour out through your spirit some small measure of that love so that we can reach the high winds in our midst, the, the, the folks from, from the Middle East, from Thailand, from India, who are our coworkers, our neighbors. And maybe some of them would be saved in two or three or four generations from now Literally millions of their people would know Jesus, and then they would reach other people for Jesus, just as you did more than 100 years ago in my own family. Could we do the same for some other people's family and for their tribe? Help us to be that kind of church. As we launch this church, make us this kind of beautiful, gospel-centered, missional church that will do whatever it takes to help people meet have the infinite gift of love and salvation from our great and beautiful Savior, Jesus. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.